All right, welcome back to week two of A Better Way Forward. This is a journey to 2023, so you can approach the new year healthy, completely healthy. Today, talking about the difference between you do you versus you be you. If you've ever heard that term before, you know what we're talking about. And so really focusing on the last few weeks of the year, um, getting to the point of January 1st being the very best we can be so we can enter refreshed, rooted, and ready for the next year so we can be proactive and actually on purpose on purpose for not just the month of January, but for the whole year. And so the foundation of this series is 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. This is the Apostle Paul encouraging us at the return of Jesus, giving us a blessing, etc. It says, now may the, may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through, that is, separate you from profane and vulgar things, make you pure and whole and undamaged, consecrated to him, set apart for his purpose, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept complete, found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. And your spirit's also been called your heart, it's your heart, your mind, and your flesh, right? And then we are knowing that our spirit is our be identity, our soul is our self, it's our emotion, it's who we are, and our body's our do identity. So we be here, we do here, and this is the connector. And so the bullseye from last week, your spirit is the root of who you are. It's your innermost organ, your innermost being, and your flesh, your body is the outer organ, and your soul connects those two. And so now we're refreshed and ready. Ever heard the phrase, hey, you do you. You do you. Normally it comes when somebody's been offended or they're a little bit grumpy or upset that you're not going to go the way that they're going to go, right? And so this comes with disagreement, maybe a clash of values or maybe lack of integrity, really. And the majority of people leave the earth knowing who they really are. And instead, they just do them. Hey, you do you, and I'll do me, and, and we'll coexist. And, and God didn't call us to that, right? And so, and the reason that we can say you do you is because we get caught up in doing. We just get caught up in, in our do identity, which is our body, our flesh. It's, it's, it's what we feel, right? We unconsciously, unconsciously live someone else's life or someone else's expectations for us, and, and you can fill in the plan there. Uh, I don't know whose uh, voice weighs the most in your life, but hopefully it's Jesus. Hopefully it's, it's that spiritual connection that you have. And so the idea of actually living and leading as ourselves strikes to the very core of our spirituality. It hits us right here. It hits us at the very core of who we are, our innermost being. But what if instead of saying, hey, you do you, people said, hey, you be you, you be you, and I'll be me. And then we'll all operate by the Spirit, by our beatitude, which is good, right? Hey, you, you, you just be you. And what happens with that, when that actually takes place is we're at peace with being who we are instead of doing something for approval, attention, admiration, acceptance, all the A words you can think of, I guess, right? What if instead of trying to please others, you accepted who you are and believed that God was pleased with you? There's all kinds of Proverbs that say, Proverbs 20 and 25 says, it's dangerous to be concerned with man's opinion, but if you, if you trust in the Lord, you will be safe. If you stay connected to God, you will be safe. Proverbs 16, 7 says, when a man's ways pleases the Lord, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies at peace with him, to be at peace with him rather. And so today we're talking about you connecting with you instead of you trying to connect on others' levels. Right Today I want you to walk out of here knowing that you can be you and that God is pleased with you regardless of how pleased you are with you, regardless of how you feel about you. God says he's pleased. He looks at you and he says he's pleased. You can reference the baptism of Jesus if you want to go deeper on that. So this is what the Apostle Paul was challenging us with when we were talking about being pleased and actually going in yourself as opposed to you being you as opposed to you doing you. You find this in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Note takers, you can take notes. If you're joining me online, this is for you. Thanks so much for the moments I get to have with you. It means more than you know that you're here, and uh, I'm glad to be a part of your life. And so let's open up to Ephesians 4, 22 and go through 24. And I am in the Amplified Bible. Here's what it says. Regarding your previous way of life, you put off your old self, completely discard your former nature, which is being corrupted through deceitful desires, which is flesh, which is your body. Okay. And be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind. In the spirit of your mind, your soul connects to your spirit and your body, right? 
and put on the new self, the regenerated and renewed nature, created in God's image, God-like in the righteousness and holiness of the truth, living in a way that expresses to God your gratitude for your salvation. Put on the new self is hard. The new self is really talking about that regeneration we talked about last week. When God regenerates your spirit, it saturates your whole being, right? And so then born again means that I'm a baby all over again. And some take offense, don't call me a baby. But the reality is, is, is you're not Benjamin Button, right? And so don't take offense to this because it'll stunt your growth, all right? And the point one, point one is this, if you're taking notes, point one is you are reborn a baby. Regardless of how old you are physically, you're not the same age spiritually as you are mentally, emotionally, physically. Because all children of God are born again. We see that throughout Scripture. And so here's how I can confirm that, that we're babies again. It's okay. I, I was here. We're all at different levels in our faith and our spiritual maturity. Hebrews 5, uh, 12 through 14 says, You actually need someone to teach you again the elementary principles of God's word from the beginning. You need to be taught again from the beginning. You are continually in need of milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is a spiritual infant. We're just babies again. We're reborn babies. But solid food is for those who are spiritually mature. They've grown in their relationship with God. They become better disciples because they've applied God's principles to their lives. Whose senses are trained by repetition. They've been engaged. They are consistent followers of Jesus to distinguish between what is morally good and what is evil. So those who actually are mature know the difference between good and evil. They have integrity. They have godly character, Christ-like character. And so then they, they are chewing on, they're chewing the fat while our, us babies are drinking the milk. And that's okay. What that means is we must reorient ourselves and not lean on the knowledge that we had before we came back, before regeneration, before we were born again, before salvation. Right? We can't go back to that and think about what we did or knew before. Right? This means we must not do the things that we used to do or, or use the excuse of, well, that's all I know. That's pride. That's all I know. Because your new self doesn't go or live or lead their life based on knowledge. They go and live based on belief. It's a belief in Jesus, right? And the reality in this is you get to start all over and you get to build your life based on the truth instead of culture. You get to learn, God, learn God's will for your life instead of your way. You begin to trust him instead of trusting you and only trusting you. So this takes leaning into your spiritual relationship, which is rooted in the word. It's the Bible. Okay. Now, what typically happens in the process of salvation or regeneration, being born again, your spirit regenerated is born again. We go back to what we used to know. And so we go back to that and we expect change. And we do what we always did, but we expect there to be a difference. And because we don't see a difference, we wonder, well, I guess God isn't who he says he is because I prayed that prayer and I'm going to come back to my mess and everything's the same. And everything's the same because you have to go back to the beginning and start reading and learning all over again. When you do that, you're just going back to your old self. And we're told to put off the old self and put on the new self, right? That's your way. That's your way. And that's the only way you know, and that's okay. But that's what you know. And you have to come to a, a belief in your heart, right? And so then you go in your way instead of in God's will. And you go in your mind, right? Your mind and your flesh, as opposed to your spirit, as opposed to your spirit, and so we go back to you do you, okay? You do you and I'll do me. And you just believe now it's going to be a little bit different. And without the connection, without the regeneration of your spirit and that saturating your soul and coming out so you can be salt and light everywhere, right? When we go back to me doing me, the Bible tells us this is working to gain the world and that causes us to forfeit our soul. Mark 8, Jesus challenges us to follow him, to give him our heart, and to let him lead. He says, if, if you do this, you'll live forever. And then he asks us in verse 36, Mark 8, 36, For what does it benefit you to gain everything in the world with all its pleasures and forfeit your soul and lose your soul? What does that mean? What he's asking is, what happens when you lose the space 
where you experience God's unfailing love and incredible forgiveness. What happens when you lose that space? We talked about pace of life last week, if you missed that. And when this happens, you lose, when you go so fast and you lose that space, you lose your eternal perspective, life after this, right? And you confuse what's important with what's not important, and those get all mixed up, and you ultimately lose your compassion, right? In other words, you gain the world. You gain approval, acceptance, attention, admiration, but you lose your soul to get that. And those are worldly, fleshly, bodily desires, right? Remember your soul, which is this here, the second ring there, your soul is the go-between between your spirit and your body. So if you lose your soul, how does my be identity connect with my do identity? Faith without works is dead, right? And so then faith and works are connected with that soul, my mind, will, emotions, intellect, feelings, decision-making, all that is in my soul. And so if I lose my soul, how do I connect to my spirit knowing it is my innermost part and what allows me to actually fulfill the actions and giftings that God's called me or gifted me with in the world, right? And it might be easier for you to do, you know, and work for approval and acceptance and admiration and all those things. It might be easy for you to do and gain, right? And to be in a world of sin, flesh, but that will not make up for the ruin that will come when you lose your soul, when you just burn yourself out mentally, emotionally, <laughs> everything, when you give everything to, to get, when you're burnt out and you, and, 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 and you gain all the world in sin, all the world won't make up for the ruin of your soul by the sin that was there, right? Remember what God wants to do more than anything is not just regenerate your spirit, but flow through you completely. God wants more than just to regenerate your spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, The God of peace sanctify you through and through, holy, complete. He, you are three parts whole. You're three parts whole, Right? And so then as a newborn, born again, regenerated spirit, baby Christian, how can you be you instead of do you? And that really begins with who you are, not what you do. You can't find your identity in what you do because that's empty. That's disconnected from spirit, right? What we do is considered vocation. It doesn't come from a voice out there calling to us to become something, it comes from a voice inside of here in our heart, in our heart that tells you, that calls you to be the person that you were born to be to fulfill the original purpose, to walk in the birthright that God gave you when you were born. And so my question as we move on here is, what if you allowed your level of spiritual maturity to spark expectation and eagerness in your heart to grow in your relationship with God? What if you allowed your spiritual maturity to spark expectation and eagerness in your heart to grow in your relationship with God? What if you came in expectant, not based off what you know, I've read that book before, heard that scripture, message, podcast, take, series, got all that before, wasn't very good. What if you erased all of that and you came into your time with God, regardless of where you are in the spiritual maturity map, and you came in expectant and eager to hear from God, knowing that he wanted to speak to you directly? And so I just kind of entered our, our second point. You want to walk in your birthright, right? In the God-given gift and ability that he gave you when you are born. And so part two, or point two, rather, is you are born, reborn, with a birthright, with a birthright. Psalms 139 says, for you, for you form my inward parts, inward parts, which would be my spirit. You knitted me together. What holds us together is our soul. In my mother's room, my frame, which is also my body. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. And in your book, you wrote every day that was before me, before I ever existed. Now, you don't lose that. You don't lose that. God did that. 
If you're alive, walking, and, and, and around, you don't lose what Psalms 139 says about you. That's God. You might break, break relationship. You might sin. You might fall. Nobody's perfect. For we all fall short of God's glorious expectation of us. Right? For a righteous man falls down seven, but he gets up eight. So then instead we walk in this. This is New Testament, John 1, 12, amplified. But to all who receive and welcome him, he gives the right, which is the authority and the privilege to become children of God. That is to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name, Jesus. Jesus. So what you need to know and believe today is the birthright that was given originally to Abraham is also yours. Abraham's Old Testament Amazing, the father of faith, right? And the essential blessing that we get in a birthright identifies your lineage in God's family, which is the creation, which is the human race. And it guarantees you his promises, his blessings, and responsibilities as a follower. When you live according to your birthright, because he calls you a son or a daughter, you're now adopted into the family. Now, remember, all children of God are born again. So this new birth is through the sacrifice of Jesus and the word of God. We get confirmation of that in 1 Peter 1, 23. You have been born again, that is reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, regenerated, and set apart for his purpose, not a seed which is perish perishable, but from that which is imperishable and immortal, that is through the living and everlasting word of God. So, God gave you the right to be called sons and daughters, and Jesus died to restore you to royalty. You are royalty. You've been redeemed. You've been restored. You were bought with a price. So your birthright gives you confirmation of who you are and the confidence to be yourself, period. So then there's no more reason to, hey, you do you anymore. And don't take that out of context. You don't have to work for approval, acceptance, attention, any of those things. God gives you all of that because of the promise that we see in John 1, 12. And because he does, it's important for you to know that. Because when you get to heaven, God's not going to ask you, hey, what did you achieve? What did you achieve? What did you work for while you were on earth? He's not going to ask you, hey, did you, did you have a million followers on social media? He's not looking for a status or a social media following. He's also not going to ask you, hey, why weren't you somebody else? Hey, why weren't you Gary? Because, man, Gary was awesome. Why weren't you Gary? He's not going to ask me, Dusty, why weren't you Billy Graham? I mean, come on, why weren't you Billy Graham? Billy Graham did it. He's not going to do that because I'm not Billy Graham. He called, created, gifted me to be Dusty Otis, right? And so then he is going to ask me this. Hey, why weren't you, you? Why weren't you, you? And he's going to ask you the same thing. I brought you into the family, right? I gave you a birthright. You became royalty. And you share in the inheritance, why did you spend all of your time trying to be someone else? God isn't going to compare you with anybody else. He made you, you. You are his masterpiece. So he's looking to see what you become. You, yourself. So you can be you and forget all the doing because you are a born again believer with a birthright. All right, so we've hit two points now. You're a born again Believer with a birthright, right? And that comes with being born again. Remember, we got to start sipping on the milk first, right? Going back and learning truth again, getting in our heart, making it a heart belief, right? So the question before we move to point three is this. What would it look like if you stopped looking for human approval and began seeking God's approval? What would it look like if you really trusted that, song, that proverb that we read earlier where it said, those who do the Lord's will, he is pleased with, and he makes even his enemies at peace, at peace with him. What would it look like if you stopped looking for human approval and just sought God's? What would that look like? Point three, final point. God made you valuable. Valuable. 
How much do you think you're worth? How much do you think you're worth? I'm not talking about your net worth. I'm talking about self-worth. How much do you think you're worth? By the way, never confuse your valuables with your value as a person. You can be rich, you can be poor, but neither have to do with your value as a human being. And so two scriptures I just want to point to you. Isaiah 43, 4. Isaiah 43 is really amazing, but 43, 4. You are precious and valuable in my sight. This is God speaking. Old Testament God speaking to you. You are precious and valuable in my sight. You are honored and I love you. Wow. Fast forward to Matthew 6, 23. He says, you are more valuable than any other creation, than anything that I put on the face of the earth. You hold the most value. You hold the most value. Now, you should know that your value does not depend on what you think your value is. Your value, which we sometimes call our worth, it's not what you think you're worth. When I say, hey, what do you think that you're worth? And you go, well, I'm probably worth, I think of my truck, my house, my car. I got a couple, couple dollars in the bank, you know. It's not about that. It's not about that. So you should know that your value doesn't depend on what you think you're worth. Value depends on what somebody's willing to pay. Value depends on what someone's willing to pay. And so I can set the value on my truck and say, hey, my truck's got 90-some thousand miles on it, one owner, beautiful, leather, still in great shape. And I, and I might think that truck is worth X, but it's really only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it, period. It's only worth what someone's willing to pay. Now, you and I are unique. You're unique because we're using what God gave us. God gifted us. God put us on the face of the earth. He numbered our days, perfectly knit us together, right? We're on loan to the earth from God. And then, and then he went and bought us back. After he gave us to the earth, he went and bought us back to make sure that we could be in relationship. 1 Corinthians says you have been bought with a price. You've been paid for by Christ, so you belong to him. Be free now from all your earthly prides, pride and fear. Earthly pride and fear. Why, why would he buy us back? Why would he buy you back after he loaned you out? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that's you and me, that he gave his only son. Why did he buy us back? He loves us. And the value that he sees in us is greater than the value that we see in ourselves. The worth that we have is greater than the worth that we carry. God sees us, and he sees us so much greater. He sees us like this, he sees us like this, and he sees us like this. And he sees us so much greater than we see ourselves. So why should you value you? 1 Corinthians also says you're not your own. You're not your own. That's a good reason. It says you were bought with a price. It says honor God with your body. So if you want to be a rule follower, you say, well, God, honor God with my body. Is that true? Is that true? Are you doing that? Okay. And if not, I'm not here to judge you or condemn you, okay, because nobody's perfect. All right. You were bought with a price. But the reality is you're not your own. You're not your own. But also because if you calculate all the enzymes and the hormones and all the different things that are in your body, all that added together... You're worth around $6 million. That's pretty good. $6 million. No wonder it pays to give plasma. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they should also be paying you a little bit more if you know now what you're worth, right? And here's the, here's the crazy thing. In reality, in reality, if we had to start from scratch, if we had to remake, recreate every cell in your body from scratch, you would be worth just over $6 million thousand trillion dollars if we had to recreate every single thing about you six thousand trillion dollars and we couldn't really do that because you're unique you're the only one with your dna and this matters because god made you priceless god made you priceless i don't know anybody with six thousand trillion not even amazon okay and so then when god sees you it's important for you to know that the way that you see you, God doesn't see you. When God sees you, he doesn't see old, broken, tarnished, used, tired. He sees precious, valuable, honorable creation that he gave his son for. That's how he sees you. And then when he looks at you, once you call upon Jesus and you are born again, he sees you through the blood of his son, which is even greater. He calls you holy, blameless, and righteous. 
Now, if there was no hope, if you had no value, if there was no eternity, if you had no relationship, if God had no want for you, he would not have sent his son to rescue, redeem, and restore you. He wouldn't have sent his son to take your place if there was no worth. You have value. You are the king's daughters. You are the king's sons today. You're God's child. It's John 1, 12. The greatest ransom ever paid was paid for you by Jesus, by Jesus. He came to earth and he suffered for you. God exchanged his son for your salvation so he could have relationship with you. Jesus gave his life. He traded his life for yours. He traded his life for yours so that you could have eternal life, the inheritance, the inheritance. The cross proves your value. It shows how much you're worth. My favorite thing right now, Axton's just starting to do this. Axton, how much do I love you? Did much. That's it. That's it. And today, if somebody has ever told you that you are worthless, they are dead wrong. They are dead wrong. You are not worthless. You are priceless. And you are infinitely valuable to God. Infinitely valuable to God, the one who made you. So here's my question to close. What would it look like? What would it look like for you if you were to stop confusing your valuables with your value? What if you valued yourself the same way that God values you? What if you did that? We're talking about us being us, you being you as opposed to you doing you, you being you, identifying, identifying those three things. What? That you're born again, baby Christian, you need milk. We need to learn, right? That you have a birthright, an inheritance, that you're royalty, right? And that you're valuable. You're so valuable to God. And so then what if you valued yourself the way that God values you? So then here's the question that leads to our action steps. So how do you, how do you there in the seats, watching through a screen online with me, how do you get to know the born again, priceless person with the birthright that sits in your seat? How do you get to know that person? One, believe that you are who God says you are. B, who he created you to be, and then begin building your life on truth. I have a handout I'm giving away here in person. It has 100 promises of God. It talks about who you are. It's your identity. It's your identity. If you'd like that handout, please email me, dusty at dustyotis.com. And that handout really speaks to your identity. It, it is a PDF, so I can get you a PDF. Just like valuables and value, there's a really a big difference between self-esteem and self-worth. Self-esteem is giving others the authority to tell me who I am. And self-worth is believing who God says I am, right? Your identity and your worth are what God says about you. It's how you move forward. It's how you have the confidence to go and be yourself. So the challenge is this, don't pretend that you know it all because that's going back to your old ways. That leads back to your old ways. Your next step is not to pretend that you know everything. Your next step is to email me so I can send you a handout. I'm not gonna put you on an email list. If you're on it, great. If you're not, don't worry about it. I'm not gonna do that. I wanna help you move forward in your identity, who God says you are. And so your next step is to start believing what God says about you. Email me for that PDF. The more that you believe this, here's what I know. Here's what I believe. My whole heart, I give my whole life to this right here. The more that you believe this, the more you're going to become who God made you to be. The more that you believe this, the more you're going to become who God made you to be. And that's better than anything on the face of the earth. Being right in the middle of God's will for your life is the best place to be, even if it's in the worst city in the world. And everybody said, amen. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to share today. Lord, about our identity, who you've called us to be, Lord, that we are born again believers, Lord, with a birthright and inheritance, Father, that we are valuable, that we have so much worth that we can't even comprehend it, Lord. $6,000 trillion worth. Thank you, Lord, for our lives, for the lives of those who are with me online. Lord, I just ask you to bless them. Lord, pour out blessings upon them that they can't comprehend. Have people cross their paths that spark energy and something in them, Lord, with a word or a gift, Lord, where they only know that it comes from you. 
Lord, I ask that you would be with us as we go into our week. Bless our time today. Bless us as we go forward. Thank you for the fruit. Thank you for what happens because we sat, we drove, we listened, we gathered today online, and I'm grateful for it. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's message spoke to you. I would ask that you share it. Send it along to somebody else. Paul said, woe to me if I don't. And so then please send it along. If you need anything, you have a prayer request, you have, um, you need to have a conversation, you want to know more about Jesus, you want to figure out what it means to establish a relationship with God, email me. I'd love to sit, talk, establish a, a, a phone conversation with you, we'll send you a number. We'll, we'll start talking, texting, whatever you want to do. I want to help you move forward in your faith. And so uh, just let me know how we can do that. As always, thank you for liking, sharing, subscribing, anything that happens that where you risk your relational equity to build the kingdom is a big deal. I don't take that lightly and I greatly appreciate it. Now, I pray the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of Him. I pray the perception of your mind would be enlightened so that you would know it is a hope and His calling and His purpose for you and the great things that God has in store for you. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here. I'll see you next week.